Let us pray. Merciful God, help us to seek you and the message you intend for us in your word read and proclaimed today. Amen. Our text is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 13. Listen for the word of the Lord. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me, Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow and the next day, I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, yet you were not willing. See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A number of years ago, a family member in another state received a call from me, letting them know that I was in jail and that I urgently needed them to wire me bail money or else all sorts of alarming things would happen. Turns out the caller was not me. It was some scammer who, upon reflection, wasn't very convincing as me, but was very skilled in getting people to do what he wanted by scaring them. Even when the threat didn't really make a lot of sense, we do all kinds of things we wouldn't usually do when we're afraid. So companies send us letters in the mail with bold red type on the envelope, urgent, time-sensitive, open immediately. We get voicemails alerting us that our account has been suspended, call back as soon as possible. We scroll news feeds that have been curated for us, sometimes headlined to scare us. And much of the time we see through those manipulations. But then there are those other times when voices in our world try to scare us away from our deepest sense of self or purpose, tempting us to foreclose on who we are or to second-guess our deepest callings. I think something like this is happening to Jesus in our text today. Jesus and his disciples are traveling from town to town on the road to Jerusalem, where eventually he'll be arrested and killed by the powers that he threatened. And as he finished teaching in this place, some helpful folks approach him with reports that King Herod is on the move, closing in. King Herod, who was just put to death, John the Baptist. So if Jesus wants to escape death, he'd best be on his way. Now, it's unlikely that these messengers really cared about Jesus' safety, but they do want to scare him into leaving town, scare him from drawing unwanted attention from the Roman authorities, scare him from drawing crowds of undesirables, scare him from preaching his message of social upheaval and religious renewal, scare him from being who he is and doing what God has called him to do. But Jesus doesn't respond the way they hope. He doesn't act out of fear or go into hiding. Instead, he offers them an image, an image of Jerusalem as a hen house and rulers like Herod as the fox who's always there to pick off the chicks 
who are God's prophets. This violence has been happening from age to age, but now into this metaphor, Jesus casts himself as a mother hen, committed to shielding God's beloved ones from harmful forces, even turning the threat of the fox onto himself. Jesus is saying to them, oh, I will move on, but not into hiding. In fact, I won't be moving away from danger. I'll be heading straight toward it because it's only in facing these harmful forces that people will ever be free. In watching events unfold in Ukraine this past week, these past weeks, I've been impressed at the way President Zelensky has been so front and center. In my mind, heads of state are usually sheltered away during these kinds of crises. He's been out on the streets, speaking publicly, declining offers for evacuation. I don't know that I'd have his courage. In an address last week, he stated, we never wanted this war, but it was brought to us. We never dreamed of killing, but we must fight against the inhuman force that wants to destroy humanity itself. Then referring to the gold and blue of their flag, he said, we defend our flag because it's our worldview. The Ukrainian flag is the land, peaceful, fertile, golden, and without tanks. It is the sky, peaceful, clear, and blue, without missiles. So it was. And so it will be. Friends, likely none of us will be called upon to lead a national response to an enemy invasion. But I do think that some of the inhuman forces he's talking about, the ones that oppress people and cause harm, are all around us. They loom large in our national conversations lately. They always have. And they're scary sometimes. There are bills aimed at restricting reproductive health care, restricting how teachers talk about racism and gender and sexual orientation with their students, bills restricting gender-affirming health care for trans youth, And lawmakers attach harsh penalties to these laws in order to scare people from doing the right thing, from defying these forces causing so much pain. And that's to say nothing of the specific burdens we carry in our own lives, the times we accept poor treatment, or violations of our boundaries because we're afraid to disrupt the way things are. Stepping into a new way of life can feel scary, and so it may be that we're tempted to shrink back from meaningful change. It was pointed out to me recently that the first prayer recorded in the scriptures isn't what we might think. Long before the Lord's Prayer, before the rich expressions of the Psalms, the first recorded words addressed to God are spoken in a garden by Adam, out of sight, covered in fig leaves. After they've eaten of the fruit, God has called out, where are you? And Adam responds with these words, I was afraid so I hid. And aren't these the words of humanity? Aren't these the words of our biology, of our evolution? We're hardwired to avoid threats, to hide when we're afraid and to preserve our safety and our lives. And there is wisdom in that. Much of the time we should avoid harm and keep ourselves safe. But another part of living into God's purposes for us is that God calls on us from time to time to rise above that instinct 
for self-preservation, to take risks for good reasons, and to speak hard truths, and even to carry crosses of sorts when inhuman, life-destroying forces are at work. Part of the good news of this Lenten season is that God wouldn't have us resign ourselves to ongoing misery, but to take a cross up against it in the pattern of Christ, come what may. And doing that takes courage. Thus, Scripture's most frequent command by far is do not be afraid. It's in the Bible 365 times, a verse for every day of the year, if you need it. In the Gospels, Jesus reminds his disciples to love their neighbor or their enemy five times, but 25 times he tells them, do not be afraid. And I think it would be really great if I could follow that commandment, actually go through my life without any fear, but that hasn't been my experience so far. But the emphasis of this command isn't that we never experience the sensation of fear, but that fear doesn't hold us back from the things that are most important in this life, the things that matter. Important things like telling the truth and bringing our fullest selves to the world, and that can be scary. Important things like saying yes to the deepest callings that God has placed on our lives, bearing justice, mercy, humility, and material provision even into hostile places in our world. And there's plenty out there to frighten us away from doing that. But I think some more good news for us in this Lenten season is that Jesus refused to hide. When he came under threat by powers that held sway over his weary world, And now that same spirit of Christ lives on in us, enlivening us to take the risks that matter most so that we and others can be free. There's a scene in The Lord of the Rings, the Two Towers film, where Frodo and Sam are in a battle-ruined city Their journey has been long and their quest still unfulfilled. Enemies threaten from all sides and the spiritual weight of the ring they carry with them has brought Frodo to a breaking point. In a moment of agony, Frodo despairs, I can't do this, Sam. Sam stands up and says, I know, it's all wrong. By rights, we shouldn't even be here, but we are. It's like the great stories, Mr. Frodo, the ones that really mattered. Full of danger they were, and sometimes you didn't want to know the ending because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad has happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing this shadow. A new day will come, and when the sun shines, it will shine out the clearer. These are the stories that stayed with you, that meant something, even if you were too small to understand why. But I think, Mr. Frodo, I do understand. I know now. The folks in these stories had lots of chances of turning back, only they didn't. They kept going because they were holding on to something. Frodo asks, what are we holding on to, Sam? Sam replies, that there's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for. 
So I wonder, what's keeping you going in this season of life? What good are you holding on to today? What vision for a renewed future is meaningful enough to face the forces that threaten it? President Zelensky sees fertile land free of tanks and clear skies free of missiles. What do you see? Jesus saw his destiny, divine life flowing forth in spite of the empire's best attempts to extinguish it. What do you see? In the winter of 2015, I enrolled in a Hebrew scripture class at Seattle U. It was the first class I took when I started to pursue ordination seriously, and it also took place during a crucial season of my own life as I was beginning to come out and the wheels were in motion for almost everything in my life to change, but I didn't know how yet. And on the last day of that class, the instructor sent us out by putting up a slide on the screen. It was an image of a vast, shimmering, silver ocean. And high over top it was this floating pathway, no more than a foot wide, but winding and stretching over that ocean off into infinity. And she shared a Hebrew song lyric adapted from 18th century Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. It said, the whole entire world is a very narrow bridge. And the main thing is to have no fear at all. The whole entire world is a very narrow bridge. And the main thing is to have no fear at all. I remember I messaged her later that day on Facebook about how much I'd enjoyed the class and particularly how meaningful it had been for me as an emerging gay pastor to have an openly queer person of faith teaching it. And as I was writing the story into this sermon, it occurred to me I bet that message is still there. I wonder what I wrote to her seven years ago. Here's what I wrote. On March 16th, 2015, 3.06 p.m. Hi there. Just wanted to offer another thanks for the class and for teaching authentically out of who you are. I've embarked on what's turned out to be a less than great coming out process at my church and will probably be accepting a smaller role at an inclusive congregation in the next couple months. It just feels scary and I'm bracing for people's bad reactions. It's been encouraging this quarter to see some more reality in the world of LGBTQ affirming ministry and to think maybe it does actually get better. The bridge quote was for me this morning. Peace. Friends, the most meaningful stories start out scary sometimes. But God is with us all the way the whole entire world is a very narrow bridge, so let's come alongside each other on it. For there's good in the world still. Good worth fighting for. As we journey with Christ in this season toward the mystery of the cross and the promise of new life, God, Christ's voice calls out to us over and again. Do not be afraid. Amen.